Well, hello and welcome to the second of our virtual artist talks for the second Craft Invitational, an exhibition at the Dubuque Museum of Art through October 11th, 2020. For those attending live today, thank you for being here. You can submit questions in the Q&A and we'll have time for answering some of those questions during the talk and also at the end. So please um, don't be shy and use the Q&A for any questions that you have during the talk. I'm joined by my colleague Kay Schrader who's assisting with questions and technical management. And my name is Stacy Gage Peterson. I'm the curator and registrar at the Dubuque Museum of Art and your host for this talk. I'll give a brief description of the exhibition and then introduce, introduce our artists joining us today. And then we'll hear from them. But first I have a few important acknowledgements. The Duma Craft Invitational would not be possible without the generous support of our sponsors, Premier Bank, Cottingham and Butler, Mosaic Lodge number 125, Wisconsin Public Radio, and Brigadier General USA Retired Bob and Nancy Felderman. I also want to express my gratitude and acknowledge the efforts of our curatorial team, Dolores Fortuna, Maureen Bardusk, Paul Opperman, and Carol Spellich. Their insights into the regional craft community and their volunteer time made this exhibition a reality. And now for a brief overview of the Duma Craft Invitational for those who missed the first talk. This exhibition highlights fine craft with an emphasis on traditional materials handled in unexpected and innovative ways. The exhibition includes over 70 works by a select group of regionally based craftspeople working in ceramic, glass, wood, paper, and metal. The artists in this exhibition are transforming basic familiar materials into complex, insightful works of art. And in the process, they are not only keeping traditional craft techniques alive, they're blazing new technical and creative paths for future craft artists. And I'm honored to welcome three of our craft artists to today's talk. Glass artist Andrew Shea from Minneapolis, Minnesota received his MFA from the University of Minnesota. His five perfume bottles in the exhibition are a balance of form, color, and design that not only highlight the properties of glass, but also what I consider the artist's other medium, light. His works are vessels for light, from multicolor and single hue swirls to transparent and opaque cut surfaces. His works are crafted to contain and release light. Peoria, Illinois wood artist James Pierce grew up in a family of woodworkers and served in the US Army as a diesel mechanic and we thank him for his service. He combines these two influences in his work. His wood cabinet in the exhibition is inspired by an airplane propeller but made completely of wood and although many who view it have had a hard time believing it has no metal parts. James continually pushes himself to create the forms and shapes he imagines, which means pushing the material of wood and his skills beyond traditional ways of working in wood. Local ceramic artist, Rich Robertson, is from Asbury, Iowa. His two works in the exhibition combine the challenge of creating the functional form of a teapot with the freedom of creating a non-functional form that he calls a tea knot, that's N-O-T. The surface design on the T-knot corresponds to the curves of the vessel's form. So warm welcome to all of you. And let's begin by learning a little more about each artist and their work in the exhibition. And we have images from each of them for reference that I will be sharing. And so I'll go to the next one here. So Andrew will be starting us off today. And here is an image of his work that's in the exhibition. And Andrew, if you're ready, would you tell us about yourself and your work? Sure. Um, you know, I've been uh, blowing glass. I, uh, I went to uh, Catholic high school and we, I never had an art class at all. And then you know, we studied uh, lots of different things, but no art class. And then after, when I got out of high school in 1966, 65, 
I went went in the army and spent two years there, and I was in Korea in artillery and a tr mostly a truck driver. When I got out of the out of the army, I went to the U, and I took a lot of science classes because that was my background. I studied and memorized, and for some reason, I got into took a glass class. It was my first art class ever, and uh, I mean, it was just the start of everything. You know, I got just I was just fascinated with uh, working with my hands and blowing something and making something that you can work on. You know, and I liked the with blowing, I like the act of working on in front of the furnace, and I like with glass, I like working on it, handling it afterwards, which I guess is you know every everyone has every craftsperson has that uh, thing. So I I like I like bottles for some reason, and I like uh, I like them because you handle them. You know they have a stopper and a and a bottle, and then you can uh, work on them and change them. You know when you're blowing. Everything you do is just done right real from the beginning to the end, right through the whole piece. And then you don't, that's it, it's the end of it, you know. And then when I grind and polish pieces, I can work on them for a long period of time and then add things or subtract things. So uh, I, you know, I my furnace is off right now because of the pandemic. But what I do is I work, I have a, a glass furnace, which I melt 150 pounds of glass at. And then I, I run it at, I melt at 2425 and run it at 20, 2100 degrees. And I gather glass on a pipe and uh, I melt raw material, and then, which I buy. And it's like, this is a bag of batch. You know, I buy this by the ton and then melt it in my furnace. And then I work all the glass on a blow pipe and then you gather glass and the pieces you run, you gather, you work them from the inside out. So you've gathered a, a little bit of clear glass on the end of it and then you shape it and let it cool. And then you uh, dip it back into the furnace and that's a two gather piece. Like the, in the pictures on, that we're looking at, the uh, red bottle is three gathers and the amber bottle is three gathers. So what I do is I roll, I buy color, Years ago, we used to make color. Now you buy everything. You know, the, we, I built all my equipment, which took quite a bit of time. And then nowadays, they buy furnaces and they buy, you know, the glass floors and they learn how to do things. And then I, my stuff's just a little different because we never learned how to do anything. But I buy like a this is a frit, and this is colored glass. And like in my pieces that I'm seeing on the screen here, I would take the second gather and I roll it in the colored glass, and then. I shape it and then let it cool and dip it back into the clear. So I add my color and, you know, size of the pieces. Like the swirly colors, I heat it up and then before, you know, when I have the color on the outside and I let the glass drip and the glass drips onto a steel table and I fold it back up on itself and I'm making like a random color pattern, swirl color pattern. And when you're working, all the glass is red hot so you don't see the colors and you wear dark glasses. so. Many times, you know, you make something and then you don't really get the chance to, and you don't, you don't dwell on it. You just make things, you know, you do it, you make another one, you try and make a lot of pieces all day long and get good at it. And then a day and a half later, when they cool down to room temperature, then you pick them up out of the annealing oven and you look at them and you think, next time I'm going to do this or this, or this time I did a good job, you know, I like what I did. But I keep every, I mean, I work on everything I make. I don't, uh, I just modify it. Like on the bottles on the screen here, the two, the red bottle and the amber bottle are three gathers. And the bottle on my, uh, my left is uh, five gathers. And then that's how you build up, uh, you know, your layers and get size. And that's a big bottle. That's probably 15 inches tall or so. And there here, I blow the small bubble in there and I keep, the colors separate by not blowing the bubble. If you blow a vase, all the colors come to the surface. And then I like the thick glass and the layers in between. And then I get just a basic shape and then I sandblast it and acid it, that's the frosted parts. And then I grind and polish all the facets on there and get my pieces. And I like to work on groups of pieces. And, uh, you know, when I think, get a bright idea on one piece, I can make it on another one. I've been doing work on, uh, you know, in my, studio since you know 78 
so I, I have, I know what I like to make and what I make. And then I have in the, in the back here, you can see these are, I started doing these vases after the bottles many years, but it's just that I blow the, the forms out more and then I get a larger piece, you know, so I can work on them. But it's, I like to work, I mean, I suppose like everyone in our field that I'm a compulsive worker, you know, I like, I work till, you know, now I'm leaving at six, but I usually stay till seven. And I work six days a week unless I'm busy and then I work more. But that's what, you know, I mean, I'm you know, a little into it a little bit more, maybe more than I should, but, you know, who cares, right? You know, so I kind of enjoy it. So I've, I've been making all these pieces and then uh, I, um, I don't know, let's see, what am I thinking? So I uh, make them and then I take, you know, I've been selling at the shows and the, I like the shows because people, I can deal with the public at that point and see how they deal with my work, you know, so I can, I can see how they respond. And then, which is really a big part of it. You know, when I make them here, like I said, I usually work alone and then I just talk to myself all day and then going out in the public. I like seeing what people say about them and what they, you know, what they, uh, uh, you know, how they feel about the pieces and what kind of colors people like. So, um, I don't I, I guess that's not all the end of it. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Um, so. Uh, well, let me, uh, I, there's a few things there that I wanted to um, expand on a little. You, um, you talked about how you enjoy the process of working with glass as much as the end product and that you make what, 20 to 40 pieces a week. That seems like a lot. Yeah, I think, well, I, you know, you work for a, uh, like three days is about what you work on. I blow one pot a week about, and then that's, I mean, I work on a lot of stuff. I mean, I have a lot of pieces that don't turn out. Like now during the pandemic, I'm digging through my old work and finishing up things. But, but um, you know, you get a bright idea and then you go off on a different tangent a little bit, you know, but I like, uh, I like working with glass and I like, uh, all, you know, my pieces. So I, um, I work, you know, the cold work takes quite a bit of time, the grinding and polishing and the blowing. I like the blowing because it's so immediate. You know, you just do it. You don't overthink it. And then probably with the cold work, I might overthink it a little bit. But I mean, that's part of the process of us working, you know. So like in the, the color, I have, uh, you, like I said, these are all random colors. And I have blue, these pieces here, I have blue, amber, and red. And then when I, when I drip them, it's just a blind process so that when I, uh, when they're cool, then I can uh, match them up and then I get bright, you know, bright ideas from working on them, and that, which I would, you know, do the next, the next time I blow. So, but um, like right now, it's just, I'm just working on old things. And then, I mean, they haven't been done yet, but they, I'm getting, I, I would like to be blowing also again, but I, just, you, know, you know, the money's not, uh, there's no money around right now. So with the furnace off and everything. So, but, uh, yeah, I like your quote. It has become painfully obvious that I will run out of time on earth before I run out of ideas. <laughs> that was in your statement. That's so <laughs> true I mean, for anyone I, that loves their work. I, I, you know, it's a, it's a compulsion, but it's a very nice one, you know, so I enjoy, uh, working with glass and I enjoy, I enjoy, enjoy talking. I, I talk to my friends, and they all, everybody does something different, which is, I find really fascinating that, because it's just more of what you are, what you make, you know, and it's not, you don't, it's not, you don't overthink things, I don't think, you know, and you just make it and then go on and make more. And that's, that's really the fascination of uh, working and making work for, to sell and uh, make your living on, so. How do you make that tall stopper? Well, the, the stoppers, um, the, like the round stoppers, what I do is I make a, those are three gathers. I just vary the uh, diameter of the pipe for the, for the size of the glass. So what I do is I use a rolled up newspaper soaked in water, and then I roll them back and forth in my, with my holding the newspaper in my hand. And like the, the bottle on the right, the knob stoppers, I just kind of neck off of a little knob and then pull it out. And then I heat it up and I hold it upside down and hit it with a torch. And then that stretches out the stem. And the tall stoppers, they're called a drop stopper. And that's where you, you heat up, 
the glass and, and tool it. And then you know, you turn it up, hang it upside down, and then hit it with the torch, and it falls and freezes in that shape. And I make, you know, because I make, you know, I make so many of them one kind of thing. By the end, you know, the I got a bottle and a stopper for every, you know, every time. If I have a tall, skinny stopper, then I got a, a bottle with a, a narrow neck or so, so I can fit it in there. And I work, I work on stuff, and I. I, I finish almost everything and I really never throw anything away, you know. And then like I, with the cold working, I like it because I can, you know, sit and think about them. The blowing, once you're done, you're done. You know, you can change your steps the next time, but you have to, you know, you just have to stick to your plan when you're blowing and make it and then finish it, you know. And then with the grind and polish, you, know, you can go back later on and then add to it or change it somehow. But every every piece you make, you know, makes you think of something, something else. So there's like a really unending number of, I'm sure everybody has the same issue, you know, but you can, you can just make stuff forever. And each one's different, each one's new. And it, it takes, each one takes your full attention. And, uh, you know, you can, it just really, uh, it's really a fascinating way to work. But I, I, when I was, like I said, when I was young, I mean, it was all academic, you know, so I, I studied and I memorized and I could do things. And then when I got into the hands stuff, I just was so fascinated with it. I, just went, I mean, you know, my parents and my wife, you know, they were, they were supposed to go to med school, you know, and they, they were like, what are you doing? You know, but, you know, I was working hard at it and, you know, and I think I did a good job, you know, so, but I, I never would have thought about this at all. And, you know, growing up or, you know, you know, in high school or anything like that, of actually making a living, making work, you know. And now I have two sons, and then my one son, he's a, a two-dimensional creative man, you know what I mean? So he does his stuff on the computer, but he's the same obsessive, compulsive person, you know, and, you know, reacts to details and works a lot, you know, and I find it really kind of fascinating to watch him but he saw me when I was growing when he was growing up, you know, me doing my work and stuff. So, yep. so he passed it along. The art siren called, and you passed it along. Yeah, <laughs> that's great. Thank you, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, James. If you are next, and I'm just going to, I got this image of your work in the exhibition, so everybody can see that if you've been there already, you've seen this. But this is. James's work in the exhibition. James, if you're ready, I'm you ready. want to tell us about yourself and your work? Sure. Um, so, as uh, Stacy mentioned, you know, growing up, I was always one of those kids that, uh, you know, kind of took things apart and put them back together. Um, you know, I was a diesel mechanic in the Army, you know, loved the mechanical, hated the diesel. Um, you know, I, I've just always been fascinated with how things work and how things go together. Um, and I did grow up in a family of woodworkers and, you know, for a long time, I, I did not want to be a woodworker. I, I think that's probably why I joined the military. Um, I, I didn't want to do cabinets. I didn't, I didn't want to do millwork. I didn't, you know, it just didn't hold a lot of interest to me, uh, for me. Um, just because of the, just, it was just basic. I, you know, not that it's not important. It just felt really basic to me. Um, so, you know, I, at, at, at a certain point, I decided I was going to go into woodworking after getting out of the military. I kind of bounced around a little bit. And uh, I've done my fair share of, uh, you know, all those things I didn't want to do. I've done my fair share of kitchen cabinets and built-ins and, and uh, uh, you know, hall trees and, uh, you know, different types of furniture, that sort of thing. Um, and I got to a point where, you know, I was really kind of struggling with all of it um, and just not really happy with you know, making those, those kind of things. And, uh, you know, my fascination with mechanical was always, you know, kind of forward. And, uh, you know, at a certain point I went, you know, I'm, I, I should probably start trying something where I can combine these two, uh, my two interests and, uh, and put them together. Um, so that's what I did. Um, you know, I, uh, my, my furniture, uh, my, and, Hopefully, they're my, my sculptural in form. 
Um, and they kind of push the boundaries of what you typically think of as furniture. Um, and a lot of my other pieces uh, are functional with wooden gears, screws, mechanisms. Um, you can actually raise and lower the tables by turning the crank or turn the top, that sort of thing. Um, but all of them are mechanical in nature and, and uh, you know, inspired by, uh, you know, old turn of the century industrial mechanical fixtures or, or machines or components or, uh, you know, um, all sorts of things. I'm constantly looking at like bridges, overpasses. I'm, I'm looking at, you know, things like light poles. I mean, just, uh, you know, whatever it is, the way things are connected, just, just because I find that, I find that interesting. Um, but because I grew up as a woodworker and wood being familiar, everything I do is in wood. And I, I push that as far as I can, um, even to the point where I make my own hinges out of wood. I, I make my own gears out of wood, my own screws out of wood, uh, large format screws, you know, big six inches in diameter and, and six foot long uh, screws and bolts for, for different pieces. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of my, my background as far as, you know, the woodworking. And I've been doing the mechanical stuff probably about, it's been about 17 years. Um, it started off pretty basic. Um, a screw, a nut, and a top, and some legs to hold it up. Um, and over the years, it's evolved more and more into, you know, things that are more um, complex, um, more, uh, more involved. Um, and the reason I really like these forms, these shapes, is because furniture is typically pretty static. Um, and my hope is that, you know, the that the person can interact with the piece, whether it's raising or lowering it, um, changing the height, using it for a different purpose, whatever the case may be, that interaction creates a, you know, a, a different, a different relationship. Um, the piece that's at the, at the museum right now is Marvin. Um, and I, I tend to name all my pieces um, that are one of a kind. Marvin's a one of a kind piece. Um, and it, it, it kind of stems from the fact that you spend so much time making these um, that at the end of the whole process, you feel it's kind of rude to call them, hey, you, or cabinet number 23, or, you know, I feel they've got somewhat of a personality. Um, so Marvin was inspired by a, a, a jet engine, a rocket ship, a, a, you know, any number of different things. Um, and with Marvin, and I've, I've done several uh, round cabinets in the past, um, but I find the round fascinating. Um, one, because it's something that you don't see a whole lot of anymore. Um, it's just a little unusual. Um, and two, uh, because it's because of the shape, um, it affords you an opportunity to do so, you know, all sorts of interesting things with it. So Marvin is in Walnut, um, and it's very traditional construction. Um, the slide that's showing now, it kind of shows how, how I make these these pieces, it's uh, staved up like a wine barrel. And it's a little hard to, to tell maybe, but the, I, I try and create the curve on the inside of the cabinet um, first, because, and we'll see here in a second, when you glue it up, it's really hard to access those places um, again. So the way I do that, um, and I, I found that with tooling that a lot of the a lot of the limitations to what your tools can do is your own imagination. Um, so I kind of, I kind of push a lot of my tooling to do things that may be a little odd for some of them. Um, this is a traditional method of, of uh, doing things. So uh, coping on the table saw. So the left hand slide, what you're looking at is um, the saw blade would be on, but basically you're running that at an angle over the saw blade. And when you do that, you create that curve like you see on the right side image. And that, that'll create the, the round on the inside. Um, so Stacy, you go to the next slide. Um, so you can see the pieces and depending on how big around the cabinet is, um, kind of determines how many pieces um, of the stave. It's a, just like a wine barrel. Um, obviously the more pieces you have, the closer around it is um, when you actually glue it up. So I glue, up the, I glue up the cabinet and the door all at the same time, um, just to complete the, the full round. Um, and the, the slots on both sides are for alignment. There's, you know, so I can keep it as round as possible. 
so the right sides, uh, you know, it being glued up, um, waiting, waiting for it to dry. Um, next slide. Um, and then I go through, I use a lot of traditional tools, uh, hand tools, that sort of thing. Um, I love my hand planes, my bench planes, block planes. Um, and I'll take the cabinet and round out the outside surface to, to round, um, to, to create the, the shape. Um, the slide on the right to create the cone at the bottom, it's the same sort of scenario. Um, it's staved, um, but because that's a cone, I had to angle it. So this is set up with the table saw blade at the right angle for however many pieces I had, 16 or, or 20, I don't remember exactly how many I had, and the angle I need to make that, that slope. So that, that jig will give me a compound angle to, to, to create that, that shape. And then the, the next slide um, kind of shows how I clamp it up. So you've got all those pieces going. Anytime you clamp something that's cone shape, everything wants to slip off. Um, so I make my own little jigs to, you know, help clamp it all together and hold it tight. Um, so those are a couple different images of that. Um, and then once again, this, this I, I put on the lathe and, and turned it around. Um, the cabinet, I can't put on the lathe and turn around um, because the door is separate. Um, and I've got no way to hold all that stuff together and, and actually turn it on the lathe. It's just too big. Um, but this part, I can, I can actually go through and do it that way. Um, so the next slide's kind of going into the, the making of the piece. So I've got it kind of shaped. Um, and from this point out, I've got, I, I, don't, I sometimes draw my pieces out um, and have somewhat of an idea of what I'm going to do. A lot of times I've got, I've got a really good idea of what I want, size, shape, that sort of thing. Um, but until you start actually doing it, um, you have no idea how things are going to relate to other things within the piece. Um, so I started out with a basic uh, form like this, and I, I can't see the, the one at the far right, but I think I'm starting the, uh, uh, actually adding all the, the elements onto the, the outside of the cabinet. And what I found with this, there you go. Um, what I found with this is that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thinking rocket ship, you know, something scientific, uh, you know, all these different things. I'm going, well, what, what would those components look like? How would they, how would they look, you know? Um, and what I found was, um, and a lot of these are basic designs from furniture. You can find, you know, similarities between furniture made 200 years ago and furniture made now, as far as the component shapes. <laughs> what I found interesting was that, you know, you start adding a line to it and a, and a flare fitting, and it doesn't matter, you know, it doesn't matter the shape, it looks technical anyway. Um, and I figured it's rocket science and no one knows what that is anyway, so I, I really can't be too wrong. Um, so each one of these flare fittings, each one of these components uh, were turned on the lathe um, and then manipulated on a, on a sander to create my facets, that sort of thing. And then all the lines are uh, walnut lines as well. Um, and I created all these dowels, the quarter inch dowels. I created those um, from square stock, uh, made dowels, steamed them, and then bent them in place and let them dry um, to create all the, the fittings. Um, and I think, you've, is there one more slide, Stacey? I don't, I don't remember. Is that it? No, that's it. That's it. So I, you know, and if you look at the pictures or the, if you go to the, the museum and you see the piece, this can tear, you know, this carries all the way around the, the cabinet. So I started on one side um, and worked my way around the entire, the entire piece to create all these different lines, fittings. Um, you know, I added little, uh, little what I figured would be lights or, uh, you know, little antennas or things for transmitting information. Um, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, so that's kind of how Marvin, uh, Marvin happened and, and kind of the process going through and, and, and creating it. Yeah, James, what I like so much about these is they all look so familiar, like I should recognize them immediately, but then it's like, I don't know exactly what it is, but it looks familiar. So do you, you draw from all these early industrial machinery, but you kind of make them your own. You kind of add some imaginary imagination to the forms. I, I do. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of it 
just jumping off, you know, maybe you'll like the shape of this or that, uh, you know, whatever the case may be. But for me, it's, I don't want to mimic exactly uh, what I saw. I mean, that's already there. Um, so, you know, that's a, that's a starting point. And from that point on, I, I, I kind of leave the inspiration behind and, and add my own twist or touch to it to, to create the final form. Right. The other thing I like so much about what you do with your work is that it is supposed to function. And not only do you want the works to function, but it's important for you to, that they function correctly. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which can be frustrating sometimes. Um, you know, sometimes there's, especially on like the geared pieces, things that are, uh, you know, you've got all these complex movements, that sort of thing. Um, you know, there's been times where, and, and really you don't know if it's going to work until it's a hundred percent done. Um, so you get it all finished, you put it all together and then hope it works. Um, because there's no real way. I mean, you can try and test it. Um, but really there's no way of knowing exactly whether it's going to work the way it should until you're hundred percent finished with it. Um, and for me that I, I actually like that part, um, because it forces me to kind of slow down and pay attention to what I'm doing. There's no, there's no erasing a mistake. If I get it wrong, I got it. I have to start over. Um, so it's, it's a little Zen like in the, in the respect that you, you have to, you have to kind of calm down, concentrate and, and really focus on, on what you're doing. And I, I like that focus part, you know, with a lot of times in the shop, it's especially my shop with the woodworking tools. It's so loud, um, that, you know, you can barely hear yourself think. So when you get to turn all that stuff off and start doing the handwork or, or really focusing on some of the final details and it's nice and quiet. It's, it, it's, uh, for me, it's really kind of serene. I really enjoy that aspect of it. Yeah, that's great. You can stop and think then. That's awesome. Awesome. Thank you, James. Thank you. So Rich, you are up next and here is your work in the exhibition on display. And See, I have one other image that you had sent of these. Rich, whenever you're ready, do you want to tell us more about your work and yourself? Sure. Um, I guess I have a career that dates back to when I was in grade school. And uh, I always think boredom is one of our nation's most underrated assets. And I was bored in sixth grade and looking through uh, set of world book encyclopedias that my parents had bought. That's how old I am. And uh, came across the photograph of a person in India producing a, a beautiful grain pot. And somehow or another, I just got very interested in that. And that was the beginning of my career in clay. And I went down in our parents' basement, which was half of a duplex and built a fledgling wheel. I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't even, had no photographs of a wheel really to look at. And I made it electric out of soapbox derby parts and washing machine pulleys and so forth. And turned out it ran backwards. I didn't even, I was so stupid. I didn't even know enough to use water in uh, making the pots. But I'll cut that off. And uh, I think throughout my career in clay, boredom uh, increases to show its face here and there. And so in our early days of making our living in clay, uh, which began in 78 earnestly, um, it was all about selling and producing a quality functional item, as well as a few sculptural pieces. But we found early on that function sold faster. And in those early years when our kids were young and our mortgage was high, uh, we needed a, a solid income. And so we did countless art fairs and we still have done them up until this year. And I'm kind of with Andrew where uh, you need to have that uh, public input from time to time. Uh, and so the art fairs seemed to suit our needs. Plus uh, we could change our our mode of working. And so throughout those years of making countless casseroles, mugs, and colanders, bathroom sinks, hanging lamps, 
even at one time a functional toilet, which I still have, uh, boredom sets in through all of that function. And that's what led to these kind of pieces. And so uh, the one on the left, to my left, uh, I call it an art drop. And that was the beginning where I, through all those years of turning and making vessels, one day I looked at the wheel and thought, well, this can do all kinds of things other than mugs and cups and casseroles and pipe plates and whatnot. And so that precipitated these kinds of things. And so this first one, the art drop, uh, was a way of just using the wheel to make a form. I, this is the top of it, that long uh, skinny piece coming out and then throw it down on the table. Truth be told, I was tooling one of those and it flew off the wheel and hit the floor and an unusual impact. And it was that impact that I tried to record through uh, future pieces that followed through on that train of thought. And then the tea knots uh, are made just as a functional teapot and through those years of making functional pieces, I produced a lot of functional teapots. and. The teapot is such a terrific shape because there's a lot of mechanical aspects to a, a teapot for it to be truly functional. If you were to get water into a form like this and be able to pour it through that spout, it would shoot out maybe a foot and a half. It wouldn't be very functional at all. And so uh, I decided to erase the function completely. And again, trying to use the ways of throwing in a rearranged sort of uh, fashion. So the first pot or the first pot is the little teapot spout and then that's cut off and set aside. And then the second pot begins with the bottom being the part where the teapot spout attaches to and continues up to the top, which is the tail of this form that you're looking at. And then the little knob attached to the top. So there's no opening on this form other than that tiny little spout uh, that goes into the front. And uh, then the, the handle is absolutely ridiculous, but, uh, and it's not intended to be functional. So you can take some liberties here in terms of fragility as well. And uh, so that's kind of where the tea, tea knots came from. And uh, in my later years here, as my body breaks down from handling all the tons of clay and toting them around to the various art fairs, uh, trying to spend more time per piece, making fewer pieces and uh, handling fewer tons of clay. So now a ton of clay can last me a couple of years where before it was a few months. And uh, So I don't know if you wanna go on to the next slide here, Stacy. Uh, these are some things in my shop. Uh, I think we were talking before the program started about making equipment. And for years I made my living on a homemade kick wheel. And on the left is a rebirth of that kick wheel that's now my carving wheel. And as I do my cutting and carving in the pots, most of my patterns are based on things that I found in nature. And uh, like James said, uh, even industrial trusses and that type of thing make photographs of these things that I enjoy looking at that are repetitious, post them around where I do my cutting, and then uh, use them as springboards to develop patterns that grow uh, from the pot shape itself. So my goal is each and every one of these things that I produce, including my simplistic vases, are each an individual shape. And the tea knots, knots are just a little more elaborate individual shape. And so on this little carving wheel, I've replaced the uh, axle with a little bottle jack, a hydraulic jack. And that's been so helpful to me because uh, you can jack this form way up. And when you have bowl like shapes that you wanna carve down underneath, previous to making this thing, well, I'm down on my side and I'm looking up and my back is getting achy and so forth. And it's, uh, it's difficult even turning things upside down to cut in order to get these uh, carvings to fit the shapes uh, is hard. So uh, this little hydraulic thing is a homemade piece of equipment and 
capitalizes on the kick wheel to turn the form as I'm doing the cutting. And the cutting is all done with just two very simple uh, sharpened fettling knives, uh, one at a 45 degree angle that allows me to cut right into the pot and then uh, allows me to not cut through the pot because I do want these vases to hold water and have some kind of function in that regard. And then the center photograph is just an old bread dough mixer, which I bought up in Minneapolis. And uh, that I bought back in 1970, had it shipped down here to Dubuque. And uh, I had to take it apart in order to get it into my shop. It weighs about 6,000 pounds and has a three quarter or a 10 horse three phase motor. I only show it because again, it's a, a, a case of redefining existing equipment to our individual uses. And I think that's all part of the artist and how we uh, have to work. I couldn't afford, I mean, this cost me $350 and a good quality pug mill, uh, 1100 at least at minimum, and then on up. And uh, so with this, I blend my own clay and I, I've been very uh, specific about doing that through all these years, because when you blend your own clay Clay is an organic material, it's simply dug up, and as, as you work through clay, uh, even though I buy it in bags that are mined and uh, pulverized, refined through screens to remove debris and so forth, chemically it will shift over years. Uh, a mine goes down into the ground and there's nothing to say that chemically this side of the hill is the same as that side of the hill. And so sometimes as you're working along, uh, this other photo shows me uh, working on just a, a little simple mug and we, we still have to produce cups and mugs and there's a lot of pleasure in that when you don't have to depend on it for your living. Uh, sometimes as the chemistry can change in the clay, it can lead you into uh, uh, glaze defects. And so if you understand what the defect has been caused by, you can oftentimes just adjust your clay body and eliminate that. So you may get crazing uh, caused by a chemical shift in the clay and then be able to increase or decrease an amount of say a fire clay in your clay or ball clay in your clay. So within my clay, there's about five different ingredients that I mix together. And uh, so this is my new wheel now that I bought about 15 years ago that's electric. And when I finally gave up the money to buy an electric wheel, oh, what a wonderful thing that was to have continuous non-diminishing speed. And uh, on my larger pots to be able to stand up to that thing and have it continue to run on through uh, has really been uh, marvelous. And so we still make our living on clay, except that uh, this year with the coronavirus and the absence of shows, uh, there's no income. So that kind of set my wife and I busy emptying out our storage barn and selling off things that we don't know, don't no longer need. And that's given us a little bit of income for the coronavirus. But an interesting thing about that is that my wife's, uh, just having a terrible time with it because she so severely misses, uh, as Andrew said, the uh, input from the public. And I think that's very significant when you're a hand maker that you listen, uh, you appreciate the viewpoints of people in terms of what direction you're going to. Uh, one time I started a series of acrylic painted pots where I bisque the pot and then painted it with very bright acrylic colors. To me, they were just, I was so excited about it. Took them to the very first show and my first customer looked at me and said, Richard, how could you do that to clay? <laughs> there went that idea. I shouldn't have been so spineless to give in to that, but uh, it really had a big effect on me and I just abandoned uh, the painted pots and refired them. Uh, the ash left on the surface had a nice effect on the glaze and it turned out to be good in the end. But uh, yeah, okay. Uh, these, these photographs are just of a couple of more recent pieces that uh, I've been experimenting with a uh, high vermiculite clay in order to get a really thick, thick clay body and produce and extend some of the carvings 
and the technique of cutting into a much more architectural depth. And so these are about three foot tall and they weigh about, oh, 45 pounds. I was hoping that with all the vermiculite in the clay, it would allow them to be lighter, but I scaled up and that was a mistake. And so each of these are around 40, 45 pounds. But uh, very excited about this new direction. Uh, the clay is somewhat porous. This was the very first one out of the boxes. And this one is made like an adobe brick where I produced a wooden form and then just shoved the clay into that wooden form in order to create a block. And these are solid four inch thick hunks of clay and they're pinned together in between uh, with steel rods epoxied and then steel rods epoxied into the bottom and then welded from the back of uh, uh, a disc, uh, implement, farm implement disc. And, uh, so I'm not finished with this at all, a long way to go. And uh, this is, uh, this summer, uh, or since March, I, I say summer, yeah, but since March, I've been having really hard issues with my back. And uh, I was the last patient before the corona, coronavirus hit to have uh, uh, what might be called elective procedures done. And then, uh, they were, were all injections and they didn't really fix my back. And so this is the empty metal barn. And then I got busy and between one and four o'clock in the daytime, I had enough mobility that I could cut into my metal barn and produce a door space and frame it up. And so this is the entrance on your left. And then on the right is what we ended up with as sort of a showroom. And without the uh, opportunity to sell at art fairs, uh, we hope that we might be able to attract, probably not this year, but maybe in the years to come, uh, have a showroom to offer our work for sale right on our campus. And so once this was in place, then I was able to get my uh, back surgery. And I've had the back surgery about a month and a half ago, and it's doing absolutely wonderful. I am so thrilled with the effects of the back surgery. So that's, this has been our coronavirus, uh, producing this sales area, fixing equipment that's been uh, needing maintenance, and then having the back surgery. So do you have anything for me, Stacy? I'm rambling. I, like no, crazy. you're not. No, you're not rambling at all. That's great. That was really interesting, Rich. I, I love hearing about your work and how it's evolving into these new experimental uh, sculptural pieces. And that's, and that's what you've been working on after your back surgery and during the pandemic? Not really. Uh, during the pandemic, it was all about the metal pole barn. Uh, getting that emptied out and then doing the remodeling on it and uh, reconditioning some things that were in there that we could sell through eBay or Marketplace on Facebook. And we managed to make about $4,000 off just selling things that used to occupy this space. Uh, this old door that's part of the entryway is a magnificent old door and it had this bevel glass uh, insert into it that had been hit somehow or another and uh, was broken. And so we asked lots of different stained glass workers if they could work on it. And uh, no one would touch that particular type of uh, beading, which what is a copper, extruded copper uh, with a diamond shape up, diamonds shaped down, and then the space between the two diamonds catch the bevel of the glass, beautifully done, but uh, very intimidating because each of the joints of that copper uh, material that's used to pinch the bevel glass is soldered one piece to the other, uh, just exquisitely done. And so we were able to kind of push it back into place, glue some of the areas with uh, glass glue by J.B. Weld, and then in other areas that were broken through, uh, we were able to just leave that glass in place and then cast clear resin around the glass components in order to kind of, in a sense, restore it. Uh, the thing is over eight foot, five inches tall, 42 inches wide, 
solid pine. Uh, we've refinished it, uh, got the glass acceptably well. The outside, I used a piece of uh, acrylic on it so it doesn't take the winter weather. Uh, but every morning we get a beautiful array of uh, prism prismatic color on the floor in that spot. So, so that was also a part of our coronavirus restoration. So yes, the pandemic has changed everybody's routines and, and Well, you know, work the and yep, having this sabbatical, oh, I, I think for me, has really been beneficial. No income, but visiting and maintaining equipment that I've been wanting to get to for so many years, getting things like that done, and now having this behind us, even though we don't have customers, uh, eventually, maybe we will. James, what about you? What has your work been like during the pandemic? Um, so for for me, it's been I've I've been working, um, but it's been I've been kind of fortunate that uh, I had to kind of go back and do some of the things that I haven't done in quite a while. Um, but it provided an income. Um, and allowed me to do things that, uh, you know, pay the bills. Um, and that was, that was good. Um, I think the other side of it for me has been that uh, I've had more time to, to kind of explore and experiment and, uh, you know, try different things um, that I don't typically have time to do. Um, like Rich and Andrew, the show schedule typically, you know, just wears me out. It's just going from one to the next. And I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. I, I love going to the shows. Um, but it is one of those things that um, really uh, your creativity can, can, uh, can suffer sometimes as a result of that, uh, you know, just that, that constant shuffle from, from one place to the next. Um, so it's been good for me to actually be able to, you know, sit back a little bit, um, look at things a little bit differently, spend more time on things, um, develop new ideas. Um, you know, uh, that in general. So yeah. I am ready to go back to the shows though. Anytime they want to start that back up, I'm, I'll be first in line. <laughs> yeah. Right, get that process figured out and then uh, yeah. get them open. Yeah. And Andrew, what about you? Well, I, I'm just, like I said, I'm just working on old thing. I mean, I've got a lot of work done and I have a lot of inventory now. I finished a lot of these here, you know, since I've been back, you know, this, I mean, my last show was in uh, February, you know, so beginning of March, actually. So, um, I don't know, I like, uh, I'm just getting a little lazy, I think, you know, <laughs> but, uh, I like uh, working on pieces, and I'm going to keep busy. But I don't know I'm I, I turn I'm turning 73, and I I don't know if I have it back in me uh, to uh, move you know move back to, into the show circuit too much you know. But I like working on glass, and I like to uh, keep it up for as long as I can. So we got the building paid you know paid for, and I don't know. I appreciate being on your show. This was pretty uh, pretty nice uh, event. I think so. To thank you for all your efforts. Well, we've been, we're glad that we've been able to have the exhibition and that you've all been able to participate in it, that's for sure. We didn't know it in March what would happen. If anyone has questions at this time or, or between now and when we end, you know, this is the last call for questions. I do want to give each of you a chance to um, tell us since you don't have, you know, the fairs and um, normal ways of, of getting in contact with people, what is the best way for people to find you and to keep up with your work? And Andrew, if you want to start us off by letting us know where, where can people find you and keep up with what you're doing? Well, um, I don't know. I started uh, four websites, which I have having a very difficult time doing anything with, you know, have had no response, whatever. <laughs> so I have one on Squarespace, one on uh, Weebly, and one on uh, Google. And I've heard nothing about anything from anybody. But I have, 
I found it very difficult to navigate that system, you know, of setting them up. And uh, I can upload photos and resize photos. I thought that was what I needed to do. And apparently that's not, uh, not the thing, so. That's part know. of it. You're on social media though, right, Andrew? Are you on yeah. Facebook? Yeah. yeah, Facebook, yeah, so. Okay, all right, great. And Rich or um, James? Um, you can find me online, piercewoodworks.com, P-E-R-C-E, -E, woodworks with an S, dot com. Um, you can find me on Instagram uh, at Pierce Woodworks. I am not the best at social media. I'm trying to get better. Um, but I, either one of those places, you can kind of see what's what's happening, uh, things that are new. Um, like, uh, Andrew, I'm trying different things online. Um, you know, I, I just... I, I think people just, it, it, it's tough to visualize when it's on a little computer screen. So, but that's where you can find me. And Rich? Okay. Um, pretty similar to Andrew and James. Uh, trying to educate myself more about online selling. I will interject that, uh, well, for us, it's uh, crookedhillpottery.com. And uh, that's a web page that my son runs for us. And then we do have the Facebook, which is Cricket Hill Pottery. And then we're a part of a pottery tour in Eastern Iowa here, Galena based. It's called 20 Dirty Hands. And if you go to that, we have a web page that kind of gives you direction to us that we're maybe is a little more professional than what we've created. But we're also in an art fair that I wanted to mention that's in Red Wing, Minnesota, one of our favorites that we love to do that they were just on the verge of canceling and they've converted it to a uh, virtual art fair. And it's being uh, hosted by a platform called Eventny, Event E-N-Y. And what it did is give us all as participants a certain format that we could use to plug in and list all of our work dimensions and prices. And so like Andrew and James both, we had to reformat, resize, but not very much. It was, it's an extremely friendly site. Uh, so that's the very first virtual art fair that we've had the opportunity to be involved with that really looks like it might bear fruit. Uh, and again, it doesn't open until the 10th of October, but uh, if, you want, if anybody wants to check that out, uh, not only just to look at what Liz and I have on there, but also uh, to relive the old uh, Red Wing uh, show. Red Wing, Minnesota is so fun. Anyways, uh, that's basically what we're doing to try to sell our work. And uh, the gallery, our showroom that we worked on, uh, that is available. Uh, but we ask people to give us a call if they would before they come out. We probably wouldn't turn anybody away, but we're fickle. Uh, we may not be here. Uh, we've been talking about loading our cots in the back of the van and taking off. Uh, do we have much time left? You know, when we were in, uh, we do a Renaissance Festival out in Arizona, and that's when uh, the coronavirus hit. So that show got cut short by two weeks. Uh, we had to pack everything up, head back to Iowa. Uh, we didn't get out of the van. Uh, my wife did a very good job of packing everything into a cooler and uh, we stopped at Waysides and it really was kind of a fun challenge and we made it home and we were a little stinky and happy to get into that shower after we got here. But uh, I bet, I bet. Yep. Well, you know, I'm glad that you're, you have a venue that is trying out the online, the virtual art fair. And I think that that's how things will be going. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it works and then how things evolve through the pandemic. And, and if that whole process gets easier and, and more artists start participating in it, in art fairs that way to like what we're doing here with our talk mm -hmm. when normally we'd be at the museum walking through the gallery and and now we're doing it virtually and we're and thankful for that. Everybody's getting better at it. Yeah, and everybody's trying to get better at it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, it's time to wrap up and I, I wanna thank you, all three of you so much, Andrew, James and Rich for being part of this talk. I really appreciate being here and 
Oh, you're very welcome. And for being brave enough to, to try this out with us. The exhibition, the Craft Invitational, does close soon, but there is still time to see it. So I hope everyone in our audience who's joining us today will come to the museum if you can before October 11th when it closes. If you've enjoyed today's talk and you value this type of programming, please consider supporting the museum financially through the donate button at dbqart.org and follow the museum on social media or through our weekly e-news to keep up with all future programming that you can participate in. Until next time, be well and goodbye for now.